Gracious Lord, we ask that you would teach us more of your truth, that you would help us to know, receive, and share more of your love in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'll start first. We're not talking about the gospel today, but for all the lawyers in the room, I'm sure the lawyer was just giving him a chance to speak in that moment. <laughs> There are something like 2.3 billion Christians in the world, and Christianity has obviously been going for 2,000-something years now. And I think it's hard for us with that context that we receive it in to sometimes stop and think about what it was like to be one of the really early Christians back when they're trying to figure out exactly how they're going to sort out in the long term Jesus' teachings and how they're gonna describe and, and get into describing Jesus. Who is he? Like, how do we understand him completely? And I'm gonna ask you over the no coming weeks to maybe go back to that place because it's gonna involve what we're doing for these next five weeks. Today, we're starting a sermon series where we're looking at the first letter of John. And we're gonna be going over these five weeks through all five chapters over the course of this. And we're going to be looking at them. And give, you're going to hear every single word of the first letter of John during these five weeks. And we're going to be looking at bits and pieces of it and getting you to reflect on this message. But I think it's really helpful as you come to it, if you can put yourself back to the original audience and then do the work of bringing it forward to today to where we live. But starting out by making yourself do that hard work of going back to that place. And this book that we're starting today, it may not be that familiar to everybody. Like, you know, if you've studied your Bible a lot, you'll know it. But if you haven't, you may not. I will tell you that when I was in high school, I was involved in helping with lots of retreats for high schoolers and doing things. And I remember, I've told this story before, but I remember well the closing of this one retreat where the clergy person in charge of the retreat had the readings and he asked me if I would do one of the readings. I said, sure. And he handed me a slip that said, first John four something. And it was handwritten. And I looked at it and I was, I was like trying to find it in the Bible like I knew what I was doing. And I found, of course, the big gospel. And I thought, well, that must be where he was testing his pen at the front. <laughs> so I read something from John 4, the gospel. And, and he was planning to preach on 1 John 4 about God's love. So he had to start out his homily by saying, that's a great passage about the woman at the well and all this. But I really was wanting to hear from 1 John 4, and everybody's looking at me like, what's wrong with you? So if y'all don't know it, there's the Gospel of John, which is big and thick at the front, fourth book of the New Testament. But then there are these three letters way at the back, almost right before Revelation, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We're going to be looking at 1 John. And my invitation to you is to, during this time, is to read that book. If you've never read it, read it. After today, go read 1 John chapter 1 and maybe get ahead by reading the second chapter for next week. But we're going to read the whole thing in here. And um, I'll say this too, that we're going to read the whole thing. It doesn't mean we're going to preach verse by verse. That's not what we're doing. But we're going to read the whole chapter. And then the preacher each week is going to pick something from that chapter to preach about and to kind of explore a little further. So, but we're inviting you to read and come with us on that journey. What I wanna to do to today as we start out this sermon series is I wanna give you a bit of introduction and background about 1 John, and then I'm gonna to go to the chapter that we've, was assigned today that we read and say something for you to reflect on during the coming week. So as we start out by looking at 1 John, the first question we might ask, we're setting the background, is who wrote this? And I know a lot of you are thinking like, duh, it's 1 John, but actually the book is anonymous, so you, it's not quite that in my face on it, but um, it doesn't say who wrote it when you get into the letter. And certainly the tradition of the church from the start was that it was written by John. And then later in time when we started getting all these new intellectual critical tools to do it, people began to think differently and study it differently. And the consensus largely today is that it's written by someone, could have been John, but it's written by somebody in the Johannian community but as Raymond Brown says, probably not John, but it's somebody in the community that he started that was intensely focused on what John taught and who he was and all this. And we know that when you go look at the gospel of John and you compare it to 1 John, it has the same style, it has the same terminology, it's got this tight kind of correlation between it. So as we start to look at this letter, maybe the first thing we might ask is, 
either this is written by John or it's written by his community that he was so um, focused in establishing. Who was John? What was he like? So I want to pause there and ask that, get you to think about John for a minute, John the Apostle. And when you think about John, he was one of Jesus' best friends. He was one of the people that was in his inner circle. You know, you'll remember there's James and John and Peter. They were the inner circle of Jesus' closest friends. And from their vantage point, they got to see lots of interesting things because Jesus called them into this closer place. They were the ones who got to go up on the mountain and see the transfiguration. And you know how cool it was to see Elijah and Moses and Jesus transformed in that moment and all that. They got to see that. They got to be there when Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead. They got to be the inner circle that got to go hang out with Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane when he's in the most stressful, anxious moment of his life and he wants his closest friends nearby. John is one of those people that he has right there who's waiting. And he's close too. Like you think about some of the stories that get told about him. His mom is, comes to Jesus and says, can you please let my sons be on your left and your right hand in your kingdom? He's also the one who in Luke 9 who gets really angry at the Sumerian village that rejects them. And he asks if they can call down fire from heaven to destroy this city in Samaria. And maybe here we're mindful to think about how um, his brother and him are known as the sons of thunder. And maybe it's because of what their personalities were like, I don't know. And then we read about him in the book of Acts and all the things he does. And frequently when you read about John in the book of Acts, he's walking with Peter. And Peter and him are oftentimes mentioned together as they do all these different things. And they do amazing things, right? And they go through these amazing experiences. You just kind of start walking through the book of Acts and you get to like Acts 3 where Jesus, or sorry, where um, John and Peter are going to the temple and they, and it's the ninth hour, they're gonna go pray and they pray for the man who's lame and they heal him. Or in Acts 4, they're the ones who have to go in front of the council and get questioned and all this. And ultimately after that, they, they get released. But when they, they get released, I don't know if you remember this part, but they, they get questioned and they get told, go out, but don't say anything about Jesus. Like shut, zip it. We're gonna let you go, but zip it. And this is what we hear in Acts. They say, they're, they say back to the council, well, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we've seen, what we've heard. Like it's impossible for us not to talk about all this thing, what, what we've been through, what our experiences have been. And then in Acts 5, surely John's one of the apostles that gets arrested. And then we see later that Peter and John are sent out um, to follow up where Philip has evangelized and baptized and they're gonna go lay hands on the people that are there. And we go on, like we could just go on. He's got all these amazing experiences that he has both with Jesus and in the early church. And with John we get, he's probably, scholars think he's probably the youngest of the apostles who lives the longest, or lives the latest in time and does all these different things. And the final thing I'll say about him, just as background, tradition of the church is that he was a church leader in Ephesus, that that's where he was anchored. And there's other things that happened, but that's where he's from. So that is a little bit about John. We start to turn and look at this letter and we ask, um, well, first of all, who's he writing to with this letter? And again, at this point, the scholarship comes down to saying, well, he's writing to this Johannian community. That's who he's writing to. And there's an issue going on, which I'll say more about in a moment, but that's who, he, who he's writing to. When's he writing it? They think he's writing it right after, sometimes shortly after uh, John's gospel is out. So it's already out making the rounds. And then John or somebody in his community writes this and it's circulating after John's gospel has already been one of the things that's making the rounds. All right, the final thing I wanna say is why did he write it? Well, the scholars look at it and it's believed that there was a conflict taking place in the church. And I know you're probably thinking, what? I thought that was just a modern thing. You mean they had conflict back in the church at the very beginning? Yes, they did. And you actually have a pretty severe conflict because if you read closely in the second chapter, 
which we'll do next week, that verses 18 and 19, they actually think part of the Johannian community split and left to go off elsewhere. And you'll see that in like 1 John 2, 18 and 19 kind of range. And kind of reading backwards, which is the way we have to do and look at the issues being addressed and try to figure out what's going on. I'm distilling all this scholarship down to tell you what the scholars are saying on this is that it looks like they were having a split over this. Both of these groups that were in this conflict, they believed that Jesus was the word and that he was God. But where they split and had issues with is what do we make about the time he spent on earth in, in human form? What do we do with that? And there's one group that is looking at this and they're saying, well, it, it sets a standard for us morally, ethically. This is the standard in how we're to live with how we, we function in our bodies and what we do while we're here on this planet. And the other group is like, well, no, we got that, he, that he's this divine person and all this, but what we do in the flesh really doesn't matter. That, it, that it, you can, it's all about him and his spirit and not in, the, in what he does with his flesh, so it doesn't matter for us, and they go that direction. And John, or the person, the author, who's writing from his community, wants to address that. And what he writes in this letter is really a bit of a treatise that's meant to be circulated. So if you've been with us on some of these uh, letters that we've looked at in the past, you'll know that most all the letters had a formula of how they were written. It's kind of like modern day emails where you've got a to and a from and a regarding and there's a certain format you would do a communication. This letter doesn't have that because it's more like a treatise that's meant to be circulated through the area far and wide for all the Johannian community wherever they are. So that's a bit of background. The final thing on background that I want to give you before we start to look at some of chapter one is where we got the title for this sermon series from because if you, that we title titled it Light and Love. That's the title of the whole series, and then we'll, we'll give different ones for today. But there are, so then if you go look at this, uh, these five chapters, how do you organize them? And there are scholars all over the map on this. There are some that say there's not a lot of organization at all. There are people that say, well, there are three big movements, but there are a whole lot of people like Raymond Brown, who I like so much, who say there are two big movements. There's the, there is this movement that we pick up on in verse five today that says Jesus is light and part of our mission is to learn to walk in the light. That's the first part. And the second part is how God is love and what the call of love has on us and how we understand that and we get called into love as the two biggest themes or movements within the letter. And so we titled it for that reason, light and love. But there's lots more going on within it, so I don't know where all the preachers are gonna go on this series, but that's the, the two big themes on that. So today, when you get to the start of this first chapter, it starts with a prologue. And you guys probably remember from every Christmas what John's gospel prologue looks like. And it, when you compare this first letter of John with the Gospel of John, you see a lot of parallels. I mentioned already style and vocabulary, but also a little bit of structure. And you can see a little bit of that in, this, in these prologues. So just to kind of remind you how this goes, John's Gospel, this is read often on Christmas Day, starts out this way. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. That's the gospel. And then the very first thing we get in our, the letter that we read a minute ago, it starts out by saying, that which from the beginning, which we have heard, and it goes on from there. So it's starting out talking about the beginning, it's gonna go on to talk about the word the same way. So we see lots of different parallels that are taking place with this. And when it talks about, it goes on to talk about this word or the word of life. It's not just talking about a message or news. It's talking about something bigger than that. It's talking about how in Jesus and in his message and in his life and what he does that we can learn how it is he walks as, as how he is light and how we can have fellowship with God and how we can walk with him in the light and how we can participate in what he's doing. So it's more than just a message. It's this invitation to participate 
It's an invitation to come and be in it. It's an invitation to come walk in this place and to have an experience of God in different ways. And then our author continues on from there, wanting to emphasize this very bit about this, the sensations he's had. So he talks about how he is heard and how he's seen and how he's observed and how he's touched. He wants people to get this wasn't some partial reflection of God. This wasn't some halfway thing where he came amongst us. This was full on. Like you could touch him, feel him, hear him. Like there were all kinds of ways that you could experience him. And he's saying that because he gives credence to him. He's saying why I have authority. But he also wants people to be clear that this happened, that this took place. And for those who get it, those who know, those who have heard or seen or experienced or touched, it becomes pivotal for them. He's not trying to make some abstract theological point. He's trying to invite people in to understanding that Jesus not only walked and lived and that his flesh mattered, but it's an invitation for us to come and do the same and to participate in all of that. And he says in it, he goes on the very final verse of the prologue, the reason I'm telling you this, like he gives his reason, is so that you'll have joy. That you'll have an encounter with God this way and go deep with him where you have this joy that's not from what happens on the outside, but what comes from the inside, that you'll have this deep joy. And he's really saying these first three verses about experiencing God and who God is and all these kinds of things lead to this place of fellowship that leads to joy. Fellowship with God, fellowship with one another, that you can have joy in that kind of fellowship. That's the prologue. And then we start turning to this first segment about God is light. And we get that um, he starts with this in verse five, which I'm gonna read real fast. He says, this is the message that we've heard from him and we proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. He's light and in him there's no darkness at all. He's, he's saying that there's, he's reiterating, I guess, this dichotomy that there's light and dark and the light is about God's justice and truth and love and pursuing these things. And we show that we have fellowship with God by being that kind of people, people who seek truth, people who seek justice, people who seek love. That's what he's saying in that piece. And in him, there's no darkness, which means the, the parts that are completely unchristlike in the world, that's the darkness. So that's what he says in verse five. And there's only one more verse that I wanna look at. We're, we're getting a, a quick, short jump start today. But in verse six, he starts to deal now with some of the problems that this group that's broken off have. And the first thing he's, he's gonna go to is how they are denying that they have any sin is more or less what's going on with it. And he's got some super strong words for it. But let me just start with verse six. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. He, they're, they're not willing to acknowledge their sin. And of course, that's part of what it means to be a Christian. We, you know, there are lots of ways you can look at it. C.S. Lewis used to say in Mere Christianity that Christianity doesn't have anything to say to you until you realize the fix you're in, until you realize what sin has done to us and where we are. It doesn't even begin to speak. But that's part of what it is. And John in writing this, or the, again, the author from the Johannian community, has got really strong words to say about it. He says this towards the end of our passage. He says, if we say we've not sinned, we make him, as in Jesus, a liar, and his word is not in us. So he has really strong words about it. And along with that, he said, but he says, the way we experience forgiveness, we know we're sinful, is because of Jesus. He goes on and says, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that as we continue to walk in that place, we again and again find renewal. We again and again find refreshment. We again and again know that we're forgiven, that his Life, death, and resurrection have cleansed us in ways that are hard for us to understand. 
This writer from uh, John and from the Jehanian community wants us to experience and know the light, to connect with the light and to walk in the light. He wants us to have the experience of seeing and hearing and, ex- and knowing that we have an incarnate God who's come amongst us in ways where we experience. And today, we would say that it's the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that allows us to experience God, to have God's law written on our heart, the ability to see God at work in the world, to experience his leading and guiding our lives comes from the Holy Spirit and it's there for us. Plenty of things for you to reflect on, on the first chapter of First John. I hope you'll read it this week and that you'll come with anticipation to hear what we're gonna do with the second chapter next week. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you love us and you call us into the light, into truth, into love. Help us follow the footsteps of Jesus and how we live, that we would seek these things, that we would seek justice and love in the world and how we live. We ask that you would do this in us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to experience you and to love you and to share everything we have with the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.